Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Caden Sneenan. We are editors at Dance Media, and full disclosure, we're not totally okay right now. We are um, recording this on Wednesday afternoon. At this point, everything election related is kind of a great big mess. It's all still up in the air. So we're going to just tread slowly and gently in today's episode, cover maybe a little bit less ground than usual, first in the interest of self-preservation, but also because we doubt any of you all have the stomach for a whole lot of newsiness anyway. Um, So we'll be talking about some of the more dance-oriented ways we've been practicing self-care this week. And because things are somehow continuing to happen elsewhere in the world, we'll also discuss Staatsballet Berlin's large-scale albeit short-lived, production of Giselle, which had two performances last week before Germany's new lockdown began. And then we'll hear the last message in our voice memo series, which is a little ray of sunshine recorded pre-election. It's from choreographer Darrell Grand Moultrie, um, who has a new work for ABT that he's made during a bubble residency. And actually, here's another bit of sunshine. Next week's episode marks the debut of our longer format interview series featuring the one and only Kyle Abraham. So there's that to look forward to. But first, because structure can help create a sense of normalcy, we'll do our usual dance headline rundown. And I don't have a cutesy lead in Courtney, so go for it. Fair enough. Uh, So the Mark Morris Dance Group announced plans for its 40th anniversary season, which will unsurprisingly, be happening digitally. To kick it off, the company will premiere four new video dances in a live stream featuring a special guest appearance by Yo-Yo Ma and an interactive Q&A with Morris. That's slated for next Thursday, November 12th. Um, Last week, nominees for the 2020 World Choreography Awards were announced recognizing choreographic excellence in television, film, commercials, and digital media. The winners will be announced in a virtual live stream ceremony on December 8th, and we're all looking forward to seeing some of our favorite choreographers get the recognition they deserve. And so often do not receive, Mm -hmm. especially in that part of the dance world. Continuing the digital trend, uh, Works in Process at the Guggenheim is unveiling four newly commissioned video performances this month. These are the culmination of bubble residencies that happened upstate at Kotzbahn and were filmed on the Lincoln Center campus. Now, the films debut on Sunday evenings, but the goal is for the works to debut in full for live audiences at the Guggenheim once it's safe to do so. Um, American Ballet Theater soloist and our eternal favorite, Gabe Stone Shire, has created a new docuseries in partnership with Chanel, focused on exploring the relationship between dance and other art forms. In Pas de Deux, a four-episode series, ABT dancers speak candidly with creatives of other disciplines, including Stone Shire himself, alongside none other than Alicia Keys. Casual. All of those, <laughs> all of those videos are great, but his video with Alicia Keys is especially mm-hmm. epic. In less cheery news, uh, New York's Joffrey Ballet School and its former executive director Christopher Daddario are embroiled in a legal battle after Daddario allegedly shuttered the school's website and threatened further disruptions if he wasn't paid $450,000. Daddario denies the allegations, saying that he had sought reimbursement for personal funds he had provided the school over the years, but had not held the website hostage. Uh, Dancing with the Stars celebrity Jeannie Mai was forced to exit this season's competition early after being hospitalized with a rare inflammatory throat condition, which required near-immediate surgery. Um, I will say, if you're looking for a distraction today, which who isn't, please go check out some of Jeannie's past DWTS dances. She brought all of the joy and all of the energy to the ballroom, two things that I think many of us are currently lacking. Is she doing better now, Cadence? I'm looking at you as our expert. Yeah, I think she went underwent surgery. She's doing okay. It was just one of those crazy sudden medical emergencies. I'm sending all best wishes her way. Mm-hmm. Further details about Masked Singer spinoff The Masked Dancer have been released. Now, the premise remains more or less the same. Mystery celebrity contestants will perform elaborately choreographed routines in various genres, complete with disguised partners and backup dancers, as a panelist to try to guess who is beneath the mask. What we now know, actor Craig Robinson, best known for roles on The Office and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, will host, while panelists include Paula Abdul, Brian Austin Green, Ashley Tisdale, and Ken Jeong. The show has already begun filming and is expected to premiere this December. Also, I have to say something I'm really curious about is that among the contestants, there are a number of Olympic medals and Broadway appearances. Uh, this show, I feel like, is the appropriate level of surreality for 2020. Baby Shark Dance is now the most viewed video in YouTube history. 
beating out Despacito with an astounding 7.04 billion views. Oh no, Despacito's back in my brain. (laughs) I will say that at least 1 billion of those views are from my two-year-old because her sole method of self-soothing these past few months has been listening to that song on repeat. So... Actually, there's my segue into our next <laughs> segment in which we're going to talk a little about the dancey things that have been helping us just keep it together recently. Obviously, self-care has never been more important, and self-care is the kind of thing that dancers especially are likely to neglect. We are here to remind you that you need to make it a priority right now. And maybe your version of it has nothing to do with dance. Maybe you need an escapism so complete it doesn't involve dance at all. But seeing as this is a dance podcast, we'd figured that we'd keep our discussion at least loosely dance themed. So Cadence, what are you what are you feeling these days? So for all my fellow bunheads, listening to music from the Nutcracker has provided me with at least some semblance of calm while trying to get work done this week. You know, Halloween is over, thus making it Christmas time. And for me, just hearing the opening of the party scene music somehow provides me with the sense that everything might be okay, takes you back to a time when you were more nervous about who would be cast in which divertissement than, you know, who would be legislating and leading our country. (laughs) And my other kind of self-care has been doing some mirrorless dancing, just, you know, dancing for myself around the kitchen. And for me, that dancing has been with Ariana Grande's newest album, Positions. It's just kind of a celebration of a lot of things I'd like to celebrate right now, femininity, sexuality, finding joy and love in the midst of a challenging time. So... Those have been my two little kind of self-care moments that I've been taking out over the past days, weeks, months. I mean, I know I've been finding a lot of value in embodied movement practices that aren't necessarily dance. Um, For me, like my yoga practice has been incredibly centering. Something that I've always found really valuable about yoga and the way that I at least was taught to practice is that it's very much about meeting yourself on your mat where you are and if you are not okay acknowledging that and lingering in that and coming to a place of acceptance with that it's a trauma informed practice and I think also just something as simple as taking a walk which I intend to do as soon as we finish this recording I think can be good I think it's very easy when there's a lot of stressors and especially in this time where we're kind of taking everything in digitally and there's all this news that we know is going to be hugely impactful for us and what our futures look like, it's very easy to get stuck and frozen in this very still place where you're very disconnected from your body. And I think that for me creates a lot more buildup of tension. And I think it's probably true for a lot of dancers. So just doing something to remind yourself that I'm still a body that moves through space and taking care of your body and acknowledging your body as the thing that is carrying you through the world, even in these really immensely stressful times. I can't believe that watching dance on a screen is a self-care practice for me right now. Like a week ago, I never would have said that. But I've been finding a lot of comfort in the digital New York City ballet premieres. Even though I don't necessarily love any of them, it's just the realization that I so deeply needed to see all of these dancers. I've missed them so much. I mean, you guys know that I'm a city ballet person and like I could watch Taylor Stanley recite the alphabet and find it nourishing. You know what I mean? And I think it's worth noting, like we are based in New York City. So for all of us going see City Ballet and then like meeting up at the office and talking Mm -hmm. about our reactions to like the new works or this dancer debuted in this thing, like that for us is our normal office, like water cooler talk. (laughs) I mean, even all of these videos were set in and around the Lincoln Center Plaza area. So even seeing that space and these dancers Mm -hmm. interacting with that space feels like soul soothing. They're all free. They're all online. I think they're only up through November 5th, which is when I believe you are listening to this, dear listeners. Catch them while you can, if you can. I'm probably going to be queuing those up because I specifically saved them for tonight. (laughs) Well, Pam Tanowitz's especially is very good in the way it kind of tailors the dance to the context it's it's fragmented and disconnected and melancholy but also it's not without humor in that very pam tanowitzy way Mm. And, and it stars russell jensen who you know is also just the best so 
In our next segment, we're going to talk about non-U.S. election-related news, which is to say news from abroad. <laughs> Point Magazine recently published a story about Staatsballet Berlin's full-length indoor pandemic-era production of Giselle. So after meticulous planning, which included lots of choreography adjustments and safety precautions, the company performed the ballet twice last week. And the sad ending to the story is that because coronavirus cases have been surging in Europe, the German government just imposed a new lockdown on Monday. So the ballet's scheduled November performances were all canceled. But for this brief shining moment, this really did happen. And the point story looked at how the company pulled it off. Yeah, I think for me, one of the most interesting things to read in the point story was that the company actually specifically selected Giselle as the ballet that they would perform because all of the symmetrical choreography in act two allowed for them to create social distancing on stage and it could be easily shifted to include fewer dancers without losing its visual impact. They reduced the number of willies and for the famed arabesque cops, the dancers were staggered and spread further apart so they could still pass each other while maintaining social distance, which just sounds like one of those COVID era things you would never think of. You know, of course, the dancers had lots of mask wearing, social distancing, regular testing and rehearsing and training in shifts. And the audience only filled 531 of the opera house's total 1,224 seats. But I still think, you know, just being able to put forward a full length ballet in this time just sounds so surreal. I mean, even reading the story, hearing Daniil Simkin talking about how irritating it was to need to submit his biweekly coronavirus test by 830. It just feels like such a different life than what so many of us are living here in the States. I think another interesting tweak that was made to the choreography was there's no partnering other than between the principals. Um, they completely edited the choreography of Act One. The core men ended up having uh, more like dancing, dancing and steps to do because they eliminated the partnering amongst the corps de ballet so that social distance could be maintained. And the testing that Daniel Simkin was referring to was largely so that he and Iana Selenko could continue to safely partner each other. I also found Iana Selenko's description of doing the mad scene so fascinating mm -hmm. because she had to completely fall apart on stage without coming too close to any of the other dancers. So it sounds like there was this eerie sense of isolation that was actually kind of fitting, you know, mm -hmm. disconnected from the world around her, not just mentally, but also physically. Like unable to touch people. I feel like we're all kind of performing our own socially distanced mad scenes these days. I had the exact oh same thought just now. Yeah, seriously. Something I couldn't help but wonder reading about, uh, as Cadence mentioned, you know, reducing the number of willies in Act Two so that there were only, I think, twelve on stage. And looking at the photos of it, it's like a little bit eerie because for a second you get the same impression you get seeing it normally with the full core. But at the same time, I couldn't help but wonder, like it. it like as an audience member today, would that be more comforting, like seeing this like reflection of what our current state of quote unquote normality is on stage? Would that be a comfort or would it actually be slightly more terrifying in just like that being the reality and seeing that reflected on stage. Because, you know, it's that curious thing of, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes watching television shows that were filmed in the before times mm -hmm. and like seeing crowds of people and getting nervous, seeing crowds of people not wearing masks. And it's like, oh, this is from before. It's mm -hmm. fine. But like still having that instinctive reaction. Like I just found myself wondering, like as an audience member, how would I emotionally be reacting to this right now? Like how and how much of that instinct is going to carry forward into watching performance in the future? Yeah, how long is it going to take for that to go away? Because I think it's going to take a while. I'm also imagining the recordings of this like rare pandemic Giselle being used in dance history courses <laughs> in the future. But also at the same time, like it just occurred to me as Cadence was talking, like we're going to end up with like some specifically pandemic themed takes on classics, right? Like that's, oh, yeah. someone's mm -hmm. going to do that. We're going to have to deal with that. Maybe it'll be good. I don't know. I feel like no, but I don't know if you've seen Alex Wong did like, I think either a series of TikToks on TikTok, of, yes. I was just going to say coronavirus themed competition solos. And I think that is just spot on. Inevitable. Yep. What a bizarre time we are living in. So now we have the final installment in our voice memo series. And for this last one, we're hearing from Darrell Grandmultry, who is 
an absolutely prolific choreographer, this list. My goodness, he's made work for Ailey. He's collaborated with Savian Glover. He's worked with Beyonce. He's choreographed for a long list of ballet companies. Recently, he's been in a ballet bubble in Chatham, New York. Man, living in a ballet bubble has never sounded more appealing, by the way. <laughs> Where do I sign up? But he's been there with six American ballet theater dancers, creating his first work for that company, which is set to the music of Duke Ellington. And here he is to talk about what that was like. Hey, and shout out to all the dance edit listeners out there. This is uh, Darrell Grand Moultrie, choreographer, uh, and I am just excited to share with you my experience of um, creating this new work for American Ballet Theater in a quarantined bubble. Uh, we were sent to Chatham, New York, to PS21, a beautiful place, uh, in to live in a house where we were quarantined once a week, sometimes twice a week, uh, in order to live together mask free and work normally. So it already was just a blessing and almost very healing in a way because we got to live in a way that we haven't lived in so long, you know, seven months. You know, it was taking a toll, I think, and it's been taking a toll on so many people not to just do what they love in a normal way. Uh, but I got to work with them every day, create a new work, six of them, who I had never met before. So that was one of the challenges because you have to get to know them very quickly. Uh, I wanted to create a work to jazz music instantly. I knew when Kevin McKenzie called me, artistic director, he called me and said, uh, he was interested in me working in this quarantine bubble. I think at first I was like, what? I have to live with them? I was against it in my head, but I said yes immediately, but I was like, oh no, what is this going to be like? Um, you know, just, I think dancers, you know, after you have challenging rehearsals or any kind of rehearsal with a choreographer, there's something like sacred about being able to get away from them and like almost talk about them. But these dancers couldn't do that because they were in the kitchen with me making noodles. <laughs> so this part was real. I was like, how is this going to work? Cause I like getting my break away from the dancers, but it actually was really special. We had two birthdays while we were there. We had like dinner parties. Uh, and I didn't spend too much social time with them because I do believe you should give them a break that they deserve. So I would go into my little room. I did have a bathroom. So when you're used to living in tuna can, New York apartment living, my little room with the bathroom was, it made me happy. Uh, but I just wanted to share the music of Duke Ellington, Neil Hefty, Bill, Billy Strayhorn, uh, Count Basie. I wanted to share it with this next generation. I think it's very important that they hear this music. I think it's an important part of the American fabric, and I, I, I just don't want it to get lost. So I, I love to uh, share this music with them. Uh, I think representation is huge in the dance world, in the world, and especially in ballet. Um, whenever I work with any company and there's any outreach where I see the young kids who are in the school studying, when they see me and they see how I, I speak the same language as the dancers, but I'm culturally and look like them, sometimes dress like them, I can instantly see that they see that this art form is accessible to them. So I think representation on all levels for young people, for the staff, for the dancers, and for the community is very, very important. Uh, fun fact is I was actually creating a work at the same time for Grand Rapids Ballet. So in the morning, I would Zoom Grand Rapids Ballet while the ABT dancers were in class. And then I would, I would do that in the house. And then I would run up the hill to... Uh, work with the ABT dancers. And on my days off with ABT, I would do a full day with Grand Rapids. So that's been really exciting. So these two new projects are coming and I'm very, very excited about that. I've also been doing during this quarantine, Zoom classes, uh, consultations, talking to dance companies, talking to dance schools, talking to college students. So that's been really nice. This whole moment of Zooming has been great because it puts me in many rooms without having to travel, but also being able to get out very, very important information to young people and to artists. Uh, I'm always inspired by people. I'm inspired by my community, by family, characters in the street. Uh, I love acting. I love TV shows like Boardwalk Empire, uh, uh, The Sopranos, Game of Thrones, uh, The Wire. Uh, I guess I'm an HBO person. Um, 
I love Meryl Streep. I love Angela Bassett. I love Felicia Rashad. I love Denzel. I love Leonardo. Um, I love Michael Shannon, great actor. So I love acting. I love reading. Favorite book right now I'm reading is for The Four Agreements, which is a very special book. Um, and I'm also reading You're a Badass by Jen Sincero. She has really, really cool books. Um, my hopes for the dance world going forward is that we just stay true to each other. We remain a tight community. We hold on. We keep having uncomfortable and awkward conversations about race and diversity. I hope that there's action instead of talking. Um, that's really, really important to me. And I just really hope that I can continue to uh, share and leave a legacy of works that inspire people, that heal people, and that can bring people a little bit of joy, make them reflect. Um, I just want to keep being a vessel uh, to make change and help people see life differently through dance uh, and through art. So I appreciate you and I hope you get a chance to check out any of the new creations uh, and especially this new one for ABT. Thanks for listening and hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you so much for that, Darrell. Please watch his piece, which will premiere during ABT's Virtual Fall Gala on November 18th. You can find it at that point on ABT's YouTube channel or its website, which is abt.org. And also be sure to give Moultrie a follow on Instagram at Daryl Moultrie. His account is thoughtful and joyful, and it's full of really great behind-the-scenes peeks at his work. Okay, we did it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. We'll be back next Thursday for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Lord knows what it will be at that point. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Stay safe, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Dance Edit.